Hello and welcome to Groundhog Graphics. Uh, I did a live last night and it didn't work out so well. Audio didn't work the entire time. So I'm going to have to go through and summarize sort of what was going on. So as some of you who are familiar with my other live streams uh, will realize we are not on a Commodore 64. And there is a good reason for it as finally I've just kind of given up on using the Commodore 64 and Power C specifically on the Commodore 64 to do anything practical, any practical programming. I, I've been using it for years. Now the lives, I know they're just kind of a recent thing, but I've been using it for years and I really, really, really was trying to put, trying to use it for something practical. I thought, well, let me do my finances for my truck driving. Um, let me do that, and I can do something practical and not a video game. So the more I tried, the deeper down the rabbit hole I would go. And I finally came to the conclusion that Power C is neat in the idea of it, but it's just the language needs to be, basically it needs to be redone. And I was working, trying to work with relative files so I could have random access to data. And the open command, F open, in, or regular open in Power C in the Commerce 64, it, uh, it would close the file when it got an end of file signal. And that's kind of something you can't have happen when you're using relative files because you'll get an end of file signal. And you're still using the file. So I had to go to the CC65 project, and I started copying uh, what they had written up for their fopen command and uh, applying it over for PowerC on the 64. And then I had to do an F write. I had to do an F read. I'm dissecting, you know, PowerC and how it works. I'm working in machine language, trying to rebuild these functions. Meanwhile, the whole time. I'm really just trying to make an application that I can use to record some finances. Um, so as much as I wished I could have made it work, I have to realize that at least with Power C on a 64, it's more of a toy. And you can't really use it for anything super practical without a whole lot of extra effort. Had I been using BASIC, though, I think I would have made it further. I think BASIC, I would have gotten farther in my application, but I, I don't really program in BASIC. I haven't programmed in BASIC since I was a kid, and I don't really plan to go back to it now. So um, had I done BASIC and some machine language subroutines, I probably would have had better luck. Uh, but as it was, I was trying to use Power C. Um, I don't know how it is for all other high-level languages on the Commerce 64. There is another one that I do like called promo maybe it has potential to do some real programming um, but I have this project I'm doing I have uh, an electronics CAD program I'd like to make so I can learn some electronics and build my own schematics in my program I have another CAD program I'd like to make which for is for me for drawing you know uh, woodworking projects stuff like that Something real simple, but something I made that I can use. These are other projects I want to work on, and I can't work on them because I'm still spinning my wheels on making a little program to record my finances and, you know, manipulate some data. So I am going to move forward in time into the future a little bit, and we're going to move into the 90s, and I'm going to use, believe it or not, the same, the language is called Power C. But it's not the same company or anything. It's just, it's by Mix Software. And I, my wife purchased this for me. Wife, excuse me, my wife purchased this for me on Christmas a few years ago. And she also got a BCD library, binary coded decimal uh, add-on for it. Because this, uh, this compiler is still sold today. So you, you can actually go out, you can buy it. comes with a nice book. Only problem is the book. My book, it's brand new, but it's so old that the binding broke when I opened it. But it comes with a brand new book. 
and um, you can still get it by mixed software. But anywho, yeah, it's a different manufacturer or a different software developer, but it is a lot more modern and it seems a lot easier to work with than trying to work with C on the Commodore 64. Now, Abacus Super C on the Commodore 64, maybe that would have been better, but it's got some issues that I know right off the bat with some bloat, with making bloated executables. Because when it links in a library, it does not care what library functions you use. It just links in everything. Everything that's in that library, all that object code. So if you have a Hello World application, you're looking probably at minimum 25 blocks of data just to say hello world that kind of turned me off to it plus super c has some is very temperamental and i noticed that when i work with it uh, i try to work with it. i get freeze ups and stuff when i'm working on the emulator it's like it's very just very particular um i so i don't i don't really know much about it i don't know the internal workings of, with it but whatever it is it doesn't like to work right for me unless i have it on my actual c64 being that i'm a truck driver i'm gone almost all the time so i have to use emulation almost all the time and even if i go home and i make a video for you i don't have a capture device so back bam i'm back to the emulator so now that is a summary of some of the stuff that I was talking about last night when I started this Power C video or Power C Live. So we are on MS DOS. This is an emulated 486. The emulator I use is PCEM. PCM is what I call it. Um, there's no Windows, and that's pretty much that's where we're at for the operating system and of course I'm still using C so now I guess what I can do is go and start working on some of the code and and try to make another video this time with audio so I guess we should start off by mentioning that power C is not an IDE like the Commodore 64 version had its own little operating system and everything with it. This one is just a command line compiler. So what I'm using is an editor called FED. And that stands for Folding Editor. And I found this editor probably a year ago just searching through random editors. And it seemed pretty nice. I'm also using Norton Utilities. The NCD to make life a little easier on the operating system and there we go and I also have fed I just made a batch file I believe it was that abbreviated or changed fed to CED the CED was the same uh, command I would give uh, power C on the Commodore 64 so it's just easier for me to remember so CED is actually fed, and the program is truck.c, for lack of a better name, and there we go, there's fed. Now, we see all the red, the red in fed is uh, functions that are folded, or macros that are, I guess, compacted. Now, if I hit Control E, I can expand all of it. If I hit Control E again, it's all folded. And the nice thing about this um, this little editor is it's highly customizable. But on the downside of that is I've customized it, so it's only really good for me. So every person who wants to use this program is probably going to have their own preferences. And the way they operate this program will be quite different from the other person. But some of the things I've left default, like control E for folding and unfolding everything, that was the way I got it default. But uh, control F was the way to fold something before. And now I have it as control W because I wanted control F to be fine. 
So then, let's see what else we got in this editor here. Um, if I hold Alt down, we've got this menu comes up. So we have File, we got uh, Open, Close, Write, and Save, uh, Print, View Files. You can have multiple files open at the same time. You can uh, scroll through them with Next File. However, I have not seen a previous file, so you can only go scroll in one direction through all your files. Not the end of the world unless you have a whole lot of files open. And we have Edit. And it's got a lot of functions in here that I have not even used yet, so I don't even know what they're for. Like there's Cut, Copy, Paste, but then there's Clipboard, Cut, Copy, Paste. I think that that Clipboard, Cut, Copy, Paste may be for Windows. Uh, from reading through a little bit of the documentation on this Fed, it seemed like that might be a Windows thing. Which, we're not in Windows, we're in DOS, so probably wouldn't do anything different. And you can do some lowercase, uppercase, I haven't used any of that. Binary uh, character, don't know what that does. Transpose, eh, don't know. Search. Um... A lot of stuff in here I haven't really used. I have used Search and Replace. Works fine. Little um, awkward, I guess, compared to what you would be using these days and how you would do a Search and Replace. Let's just say it wouldn't feel it wouldn't feel like you know. Oh yeah, you know this is obviously how you do it, but it's not hard to work with and it, it works. It works fine. So um, Search and Replace works good. Other stuff on here don't have a lot of experience match brace probably matches the braces up um that's cool i haven't used it though but yeah there's a lot of stuff i still have to learn because i'm pretty new to fed and we have miscellaneous where you can fold like a function or expand collapse you can record macros in it uh, i haven't had a need for that but you can do it tools you can run a command from, you know, from DOS. Uh, you can go to DOS shell. It has make and compile. I haven't used those yet. Um, I actually wrote a batch file. And you see at the bottom of CC. So I added my own menu option, which is very easy to do in this. And I added my own little menu option, which runs a batch file that compiles my program. And then if the compile is successful, it executes it. I'll show you the batch file right after the menu here so we have configuration and display mode search mode tab size I changed tab size to 2 it was defaulting uh, 4 I think most programs do um, I got used to having a uh, basically a tab of 2 working on the Commodore 64 power C even though there is no tab key I, I would just do two spaces so my tab size is two. We got options, colors, key mapping. That's where you can do a whole lot of customization. Like when I got this program, let's say if you're, I, I don't know, if you're a Windows user, I don't know about Linux, but if you're a Windows user, you do like Control X will cut, Control C will copy. And in this, it didn't do that. But by going to key mapping, I can set Control X, Control C to do everything that I'm used to. Control V paste now, but this is all customized in my particular version. Like I said, everybody's version of this program would be probably uh, quite different, at least for your shortcut keys. Um, then, and then it's also important every time you change a configuration option, be sure to save the configuration because it won't save it automatically. And the next time you come in, you're going to be like, what? Why doesn't it work? It loses it. Then there's help. And I haven't done much with this, but I bet you that we can add our own custom help files to this, which could be great. Like if you, let's say, what would be more awesome than having the full function list of ANSI C right there in our help menu? We just click it, and bam, we can go and look up a function that we don't know. Or we, are, or, you know, we need to get slightly... If we go, you know, something you, got, you don't remember how the parameters go or something, you can just look it up real easy. I bet you we can do that. Haven't gotten to that yet. I've only been using it for about a week now. So that is so fed in a nutshell. Then 
Um, I'm going to show you my simple batch file that I'm using. So control O is open and that was default. So CC dot batch and that's it. That's what I'm doing to compile and PC power C compiler truck dot C source that's source file name forward slash C is means compile every time no matter if the file is changed or not. I was having an issue before where I was changing the file, but it wasn't compiling. So I just put it in forward slash C, which which is fine because pretty much every time I run it, I've changed something anyway. So, um, but I don't know why I was doing that. And then I have forward slash E, which creates an executable, so it links it. And then forward slash uh, I, which gives it a, another directory to look in for include files. And I have some custom include files in, in that directory. Then, of course, with the batch file, I checked the return code of the last program that executed. So that I did that with if not error level one, then it will execute truck.exe. So basically, if our compile is successful, we get a return code of zero then it'll execute. If we do not, it does not execute, and we can, that way our screen remains the same after our compile, we can see what errors we have or whatever. I could also do a forward slash W, which I really should do, to give us turns on warning. So I will hit control S and save it. Control S is not default. I believe it was control W for write file. But I switched to Control S because that's pretty much what I'm used to with every program I use these days on a modern computer. Now, to scroll to the next source code uh, file I have on here, it was Control N, and I don't remember if I changed Control N or not. Let me see. Control oh no, Control N still works. So. Control N will move you to the next source code file. I also changed it to do a control right arrow would do the same thing. I wanted control N to mean like, you know, create a new file. But if we go to Alt F, like there is nowhere for a new file. So I'm thinking new is actually open. And if you open something with a new name, that would create a new file. That's my guess. But I already have control O for open, so control N would be redundant. So there it is. A little bit more on Fed. Now I guess we're ready to go over some of the code that I have. This program is so far basically identical to what I was working on on the Commodore 64. But the Commodore 64, what took me months to try to get to work, has only taken me a week to pretty much make everything I was trying to do on the Commodore. That's why I switched over. Uh, I love my Commodore, and I'm not going to be done with Commodore videos. Of course, I'm going to make more, but I'm not, I've given up on the idea that I can make my Commodore 64, I can make it practical to use in 2023, which is what I was trying to do. It's okay. It's still a fun computer. Um, but DOS, definitely, I it gives us a, a lot more tools that we can use to make a little bit more progress on applications, so that's the way I'm going for now. Now, I believe if I expand my include, that'd just be all my include files. Let's go ahead and do that. So, including a lot of the basic stuff. You see, like in PowerC on the Commodore 64, there was no console input output header file. There was one that I created, but none of that came with it. Um, and I have my GGSCD, Groundhog Graphics Standard header file. It just got a few defines in it. I think it has some key defines, like ASCII code key defines in it on here. And it did not have that on the 64. And it really shouldn't have it on here. So at some point, I need to separate that. I need to create a separate file for, like, a DOS, DOS file for... Uh, you know, DOS related stuff and ASCII codes instead of having it in my standard header file. Anywho, string.h got a whole lot of string routines, a whole lot more on here than you did uh, back with Commodore 64, standard 
STD lib, that didn't even exist. Uh, BIOS, that's great. Does some BIOS stuff for DOS. Uh, C-Type has some different things in it. Uh, like two upper, like the uppercase of characters, stuff like that. So, if we scroll down, uh, type def struct. You know, when using PowerC on the 64, and I know I'm bringing this up a lot, but that's what I just came from. Um, it's, uh, I always have to write it out with type def struct on a separate line. But in this, I know I technically don't have to, but I just... I just kind of got used to that, so that's why I have my type def on a separate line right here. And then, let's see what we've got down here. I have a buffer size, and I do 25 lines times um, three pages. And each line is 81 characters, so it's like an 80-character screen plus one for the terminating null. Now, you're probably thinking, well, if you're going to create an array, why don't you just create a multidimensional array? Sure, I could, but frankly, why? It's like if you create a multidimensional array, it's, it's way more difficult or complex to pass, to pass it to another function. At least in my experience, I was like, this is just, I get to, I like basically cast it from multidimensional to single dimensional, from single dimensional back to multidimensional. I'm like, well, let's just keep it single dimensional and just work with it in a multidimensional way. So that's what I'm doing here. And it just keeps it easy for me to pass like an array to another uh, function. Then character lines really should have named that buffer. But that is the main buffer where all the lines of text from our form will be stored. So that's the buffer with the buff size of three pages. And then we have the last line for integer. This stuff right here is totally not the way to keep things. A global variable just, just sitting out in the open like this. Normally, I would like to take my globals and put them inside of a structure. So that way, they're a little bit more confined and you have a lot less chance of having conflicts between different source files. But for now, and just some testing and just building, and I did this, a lot of this just quickly, um, it's okay for now, but I'm gonna clean it up later. So we have last line and current line, which is current line, um, all temporary stuff. I'll, I'll change that stuff later. Um, and then let's expand the next function. Just go right on down the line. Uh, Control W. Set window. So this is for scrolling the window, which was so much easier on here. I tell you, programming in this Power C in DOS has been like a breath of fresh air. Now, I, I know it was fun. I enjoyed working with the Commodore, but man, yeah, I can do a lot of stuff in here pretty simply without having to worry about being exceedingly efficient to make something work. Because my scrolling routine on this, it sucks. I mean, it's it's totally just, it's just basic, but it works. And it's not nearly optimized for speed, but it works, does what I need it to do. Where I, on the Commodore 64, I had to really worry about the speed of it to get it to scroll at a, you know, a decent rate so it wouldn't look all choppy. But yeah, I got scrolling working. That was, and it really wasn't that hard. I just scroll using printf. That's basically it. So printf is actually fast enough. So set window sets up our scrollable window. So it's going to set it up for one. It's going to say, here's your buffer with all of your lines of text. This will be like the file we load that will have a bunch of text in it with questions and stuff. They'll all be there. So it has something to scroll and work with. And it'll have the total number of lines. And it will have the very beginning row, Y1 and ending row. So basically a top and bottom row, same as I had in the Commodore 64. That way I could put a header on a screen and I could uh, have the header just stay where it's at and it doesn't change when I scroll around. The header could say like, you know, you know, Groundhog Graphics Trucking Application, 
version one and it would just sit there and stay there and not change so that's why i have it where i can set my window at a top row and a bottom row so i can have a header and a footer also optionally if i didn't care and i didn't have a footer let's say i could just set it for the very bottom row and it would be the full you know full full bottom part of the screen or full bottom and top if i just set y1 to zero as well so going down now i'm using a type def here this type def which is vw for view window um i have a global here a global struct which uh is the g view window well g underscore view underscore window is a lot to type so i use the type defs and i create a little pointer called gv that points to it which is a heck of a lot easier to type and I just do GV to access all of my elements of that structure. So GV is now accessing my global. So we have the GV line, which is the top line of our buffer. The buffer, that means when you scroll downward in a window, that line number will increase as you scroll down and it decreases as you scroll up. So it's a way to keep track of where we are in that buffer. And then we have the total lines, and we have the Y1 and Y2, the buffer itself, and that's it. That sets up our window. Next, we have the actual window scrolling routine. And this is just as simple as it gets, and that's all I needed. It was something easy and simple. I didn't have to be fancy. Uh, let's expand that. So we have... We have, looks like a lot to explain, but basically what this thing does is it turns a cursor off while it scrolls in an attempt to get the cursor not to kind of flicker along the screen. So far, that didn't really matter. It didn't help, but whatever. I might take this out later. Um, pose cursor. Now, this is more of a specific to your operating system and your language as to what this is going to be in this one it's position cursor but i mean this could be curse curse pose or just you know c position or anything okay because this is an ansi c this is this is specific to dos these are dos functions created by mix power c and they named it whatever they want pose curse not the name i would have liked but it is what they came up with and that's what it, what works and i believe that is in the header file bios.h, which would be a bunch of DOS related stuff. I think that's where this cursor, all the cursor routines are located. So, scrolling down, cursor off. This is where it prints the lines from the file that you've loaded. And we haven't even gotten to the loading file function, but let's just assume the file is loaded into our buffer. And we just go from counter. And we count the number of lines that are, exist between our Y1 and Y2, our top row and our bottom row. And we will go ahead and it just counts them. It prints them. And it will blank. If, if the line doesn't use the entire 80 characters, we could potentially have a problem with uh, longer lines staying staying on the line that we printed on if we've only printed a shorter line what would be a better way of saying it sounds really confusing um basically it's a way to clear the entire line that we're going to print on just to make sure we don't have leftover garbage there when we're scrolling the text file up and down so what it does is it just blanks out everything after wherever the cursor is at that moment that we run it so first we print our line from our text file, then we blank the rest of the line. So that's how we just keep everything from leaving trash on the screen. And then cursor on, and that, that's it. I mean, that's the scrolling routine. As I said, it's simple, totally not fast, about as slow as you can make it, and it's still totally workable. And we go down here, LQ, load question file. Probably could have came up with a better name than LQ file, but that's what i got for now as you know you got to come up with a million names you're just not going to be able to get great names all the time however i am 
enjoying the luxury of being able to create larger variable names and larger function names and use camel case and underscores without worrying about it because in power c on the commodore 64 you had to worry about using underscores in your functions uh, because like, if you use the library utility the library utility wouldn't add those functions right so and you couldn't do camel case because I think the library utility would have a problem with that too. So you were really stuck to seven characters, all lowercase, or all uppercase, no special characters, and that's what you had in Power Scene the 64. And really, seven characters is difficult to come up with a name that really represents what a function does every time. So, I mean, even now, I'm terrible at naming. I still screw it up, but at least I don't have the limitation of seven characters to really make what I'm make the name just completely horrible and almost seem unrelated <laughs> to what the function does. So let's go ahead and expand LQ file. So here we are with LQ file. And basically it just opens up a file, text file. It uh, starts out by clearing out the buffer that we have, which our buffer, if you remember, is called lines. Um, I should have named it, just named a buffer. But anyway, it's lines for now. And it cleared it out just in case whatever previous contents were in there. We want to make sure it's a clean slate because we're loading over it. And we would have leftover garbage in there if we loaded another file right over our buffer the way it was before. It would just leave garbage in there. We don't want that. So clean out the buffer. And then we come down here. And we get our lines. We get with F gets. F, which is file get string. And we get all of our lines. And we go ahead and we store them in our buffer. And you see right here, instead of a two dimensional array, I'm having my, I have my single dimensional array. And then I just multiply count by 81, because we have 81 characters per line, is the way I, I allocated that memory. So that will effectively be the same as a two-dimensional array. And if you use a two-dimensional array, even when you reference it, you may not see it, but it's still doing the multiplication in the background. Is it faster than what I'm doing here? Technically, I don't think it should be. So this should be equally as fast as just using a two-dimensional array or just doing the uh, multiplication manually. It should be the same speed. Unless it just depends, I guess, on the implementation of the language, how well it's implemented. But it should be the same. And frankly, I'm not even that worried. It's not a video game, and this works perfectly fast, so no problem. Set window, we already looked at. Sets up our window, our top and bottom rows, and our buffer, and all that good stuff. Then we come down here. And what do we got here? Count less buff size okay so what this does is this goes through the entire file and looks for a 10 ascii i have not looked up 10 in ascii but i have a strong suspicion it's probably line feed because every time i was printing the file out before and i was not looking for this 10 i was getting double lines because i was printing a new line after every line manually but then huh, huh, excuse me but, but then um yeah i was getting a double line every time i printed a line and i started looking through and i saw this 10 and i go hmm that's probably line feed so i went i go through and i change all the tens to zeros just wipe them out now that problem i don't have that problem anymore so then we close the file and that's the end of our file is now loaded Next on our ingredient list is the blank line function, which just gets the current cursor column, subtracts it 80, and uses put character to put a bunch of spaces in, and blanks the line. Easy peasy. And we have print line, and that just prints our lines. And what makes it special is that my lines, let me go and open it up a file. Hold on. 
I have trip.scn, right? Here's a, a question file I've made. Here's the questions I've made. Here, after the questions, are the options that uh, pertain to that particular line. Now, these options, where this very first slash appears, that is the end of our printable line. So that's what print line does. It looks for this very first backslash that says that's it. That's all we print. It doesn't print all the rest of this because this is for internal use. So backslash Q0, question 0, could be question 1. You can really you can start wherever you like. Um, and then, huh, Jesus, uh, yawning a lot. So then, this is a difference from the Commodore, and I just changed it yesterday. As a matter of fact, I changed it in my live stream. I think I did it in my live stream. And, um, but I had no audio, so nobody could hear what I'm doing. Um, but I had slash C, and slash C would be like how many characters this question would take for input. So like, let's say a date might take, I don't know, I think it's like nine characters. So up here I would have like C9, so then that would be the maximum amount of characters it would accept. Well, now I've changed it to a type. <clears throat> So in, instead of C, it's like a slash T for type, and D is for date. And if I just go down, I have T-O. Well, that would be for a type, which will be odometer. And load number, so T-L. That would be a type for just loads, which are, in my company, there are five digits plus one optional uh, character, which could be an S split let's say you're driving a load somewhere your truck breaks down another driver comes he picks up your truck okay that picks up your trailer picks up your trailer and then he finishes the load you now have a split load so you every now and then you'll have to put an s on there so that's how a load works and then i have origin and on the 64 i uh i had the uh number of characters be I don't remember what it was like 20 characters or something I was really trying to keep the size small because you know you start using up a lot of disk space and these files can add up so on here I've got a lot more memory to work with so I don't feel like I'm under the pressure I was before to make everything small and compact and fast and optimized you know so I'm gonna go ahead I just said hey origin maybe it's 80 characters long that would be a a heck of a long uh, origin, you know, like, I don't know of any city in California that's going to take up 80 friggin' columns. But if there is one a city out there that would take that up, boy, I would love to hear what city that is. So there's origin, which then starts on the next line. And um, destination, next line. And T for type is string, so it will take numerical, alphabetical input. And pay number, that would be a type M, TM, type money. And down we have TL, TS, that's all the same stuff we just covered. It's all loads, expenses, uh, TS, uh, TD for date, type date, uh, and TM for money. Everything comes down to money, don't it? So there it is. Now that is our my question file. So when I make questions for my program, and this obviously this is just one set of questions for my trips that I take. Um, when I set up other stuff, I can easily create a file like this with all my questions, and then easily it'll save to a data file that I can then access later and use the data, manipulate it however I want. So the idea is put a little extra work in to try to make it make the functions universal so later on down the road I can add to the program easily. <clears throat> now, um, control, and I will go back to our code. So print line prints our line up until the first slash is encountered. So it just goes through and prints each character, and first slash is encountered, it exits the loop. And then it does a count of how many, oh yeah, it looks like a count 
of how many characters would be remaining. Why would it do that? Is that what that is? CT minus... Yeah, that would be how many characters remaining for our print line. CT... Oh, you know what? I don't think I need that. Well, I'm not even referencing it. This is something old. This is old stuff. So we just get rid of that right now. So bye-bye. Now it's even simpler. So what we return is pointer minus string converted to an integer. The integer, all it be is just how many characters that line was reprinted. All right, so now I believe we are ready to take a look at this next one. Ask line. Actually, we're going to skip that one. You know why? Because um, I'm not going to use that. I already started working on something else. Um, line length. Not terribly important. It just gives us the length of our lines up into the up until the first backslash. Uh, is Q that just tells you if the line that is uh, currently under the cursor, if it is a question or if it is like a blank line. So blank line returns is not a question. Negative one eighth and else is a question. It returns the question number as well. Uh, define get row is a, just a convenient way to um, find exactly where the cursor, um, cr proper row for the cursor is uh, as related to the question that, that's uh, currently being asked. So if let's say you've selected question two, it will look and find out what row question two is on because we have a scrolling window. And what else we got here? We have focus line. Let me expand that one. The focus line, let's see. What that does is it lets you pick whatever line you want in the buffer. And it makes sure that that line in the buffer is somewhere in the visible window. If it's not in the visible window, it will scroll the visible window until that line does become visible. Then it will exit and it will send you the uh, physical row number uh, so you can set your cursor. And let's go down here. Previous question. When, we, when I edit, uh, questions on here. Not when you just scroll the screen, but if you're actually editing questions, you can do an up and down arrow, and it goes from question to question to question. Um, what this does is it finds the questions and skips the blank lines. So it finds the previous question, the next one will find the next question, and that's about it for that. Then we see we have the line. And that is just a little shortcut way to deal with our multi-dimensional array that we're actually just using a single dimension on. So it just does the multiplication in it so you don't have to worry about it. And let's see, we have the enumeration, uh, input type, IMPT, and that is for... Let me go up to this uh, here. Go here, uh, you see the type, my type money or type TM, TD type date. This will give those a specific type number as a numeration. So that way we can actually work with it in the code. So each type has a particular number. Unknown type is zero, and it just goes up from there sequentially. And then we have IMPCNT, which is input count. That means each type has a certain number of characters that are allowable for input. The very first one is unknown, therefore it has zero characters for input. The next one is a load type. Load type allows seven characters, including the null character. So we're looking at really six characters visible. 
And the same goes on through the list here. And then we have a little macro for input characters, which is just a way to make your code a little clearer. Add your for the number of input characters, and all it does is access the elements of the array. What gets entered here in X is the uh, input type, and for each type has how many characters. Next, we have input type here, and we will expand that, and it will check the string that's sent to it, checking for the backslash T, and once it finds, if it finds, the backslash T, it will then check to see what the next letter is, which would be L, O, D, S, M, G. So far, those are the options. At some point, I may realize that this is not sufficient because I only have one letter to represent each one. I don't know. Maybe that will be enough. Maybe it won't be. I'm not sure. We'll have to figure that out because, sure, it's enough for the trips that I'm going to enter in. But, you know, eventually I'm going to have a different list of things, repairs and other stuff. I don't know. I don't know if it will be enough. It may not. At that point, I might have to extend it from one character to define the type to potentially some string of characters to define the type. If I used a string of characters, it would be more descriptive in our file right here. Instead of TM or TD, T date would be something you could go, oh, okay, as a type date, that makes more sense. TD, you're going to look at that and you're going to have a clue. So maybe a string would be better. But the main thing is, is I put this thing together as quickly as I could to get the logic kind of sorted, get it to work, and I can do little upgrades like that as we go along or as needed. And next is the edit function. So we have main. Main does some window scrolling. But if you select E to edit, it will take you to the edit function. All right. So here we are at the edit command or edit function. And this does a few things. It uh, allows the user to navigate between questions. And it also will manage the input and the input based on the type of question it is. So it will begin by trying to, it will actually, it will begin by assigning the current window, the top line from the current window. So if you've been scrolling through the window and you hit edit, it'll pick that top line to be the current line that you want to edit. It'll go down here and it'll make sure that that line is a question because it could be a blank. So if it's not a question, then it'll come down here and it'll go to the next question. If that doesn't work out, then it will return fail. And the only way that will happen is if for some reason you load a file that uh, has no questions in it. So um, seems unlikely, but anyway, that return is there if that happens. So we position the cursor um, at the end of the question. We change the cursor graphic to a block. We will then turn the cursor on. After that, we enter the main loop. And we will update the character column, character row, and max characters. Max characters will be the maximum characters that that particular question will accept for an input. As we can see right here, equals input characters of the input type. So then we get to the switch block, input type. And right now I have only implemented the load type, um, which I did last night um, on my live stream that nobody can hear. Um, so it works, um, but I did have a peculiar problem last night, which had me scratching my head for a few minutes uh, trying to figure it out. And it has to do with extended ASCII. And in DOS or on the IBM, there is extended ASCII codes. And these extended ASCII codes, what it is, like, let's say you hit the delete key. Delete key will actually be like pressing two keys at at the same, you know, pressing two keys in succession. So 
um, it'll send two codes. The first code for an extended uh, ASCII uh, character will be zero. And then it'll send another code, and that code will be whatever the extended ASCII code is. Now, that extended ASCII code, if you're disregarding the first zero, will be potentially a duplicate of another, of a regular ASCII code. So then it would get confusing as to which key has actually been pressed if you aren't checking for that zero. I was not checking for the zero, and that's what ran me into some problems for a moment. Um, so basically, you get all your stuff here with this load type. It gets, it gets like, what, five uh, numerical digits, and then it has the optional if you remember, it has the optional last character of S for a split. Um, so it checks right here to see if the keys are greater than equal. If it's just see if they should be. Actually, you know what? I could change that to if is digit. Um, I don't have to actually put it like that. But anyway, whatever. It works right now, so I'm just going to leave it. But, um, yeah, there is a better way to write it. At least make it look nicer. Um but yeah, but it comes down, it'll put the character, if it is a digit, it will also go down to this else, and if it's a space, or if it's an S, it will allow that to be printed as the last character. So a space, obviously that'll erase it, and an S will place an S there. But now, what I needed was some typical editing functionality. And that was going to be something that was going to apply to every question that's on here. So rather than check by load input type, I have another switch block. This switch block will check keys, and it doesn't care about load type. And last night, this case zero did not exist. So what happens with your extended ASCII is you, you hit the key, it sends a zero. You check to see the zero, and you see the next switch block goes ahead and gets the next character because it already knows that there is going to be another character associated with this. So it pulls that in, and then it will check for key up, key down, key left, key right. Let me extend this. Uh, key delete. And that will be it. Then it will break. And then it will check, like, uh, key backspace. That's not an extended ASCII. So that is outside of the second inner switch block. So this second inner switch block is going to be used just for any kind of extended ASCII characters that are universal to, you know, editing, in which I think I've already implemented everything I'm going to implement here. So we have the delete key, which puts a space and then moves the cursor back one. And we have uh, the backspace, which will then move back, put the backspace, I mean, put a space over whatever character is there. And then it'll go back again, so it acts like a normal backspace. Um, there is also an event, I guess, here. If the cursor column is not greater than the first uh, column one, and column one, what that means is every time a question is asked, every time it gets to a line that has a question, there is going to be the very first character, which is actually the string length of that question. And that character is important because we don't want to go and let the cursor go beyond it to the left. Then you would start being able to edit the question itself. That's not what you want. You just want to edit the potential answer. So, um, in that case, that it actually is um, on the first column, it'll just do a delete key. Delete key does not actually move the cursor from, it keeps the cursor in the same position, so we don't have to worry about it traveling off any direction we don't want it to. And then, of course, I have something that I've destroyed the program with, and that is a go-to. And a lot of people will look at that and be like, this was a structured language until I did that. Well, I did it. And sometimes it's just appropriate. So I say if your language has it to offer and you find use for it, go for it. If you have a program that's filled with go-tos, you may want to rethink your code structure. 
but I think this go to, which I often find myself using inside of these switch statements when I'm working with keys, um, it seems to work fine. I don't have a problem with it. It's not breaking anything and making anything messy. So uh, we do have the go to, and then after, if you hit escape, you will then uh, turn. We'll turn the cursor off. We'll return OK, and that's it. Now, how we get to the edit will be from the main function. So let's go ahead and expand that. This has got a lot of garbage code in it because basically, as I'm building the program, all my test code goes into the main function. So I have some of this commented out because some of these are old tests of things that aren't even aren't even important anymore, um, which I could probably just delete. But uh, like this one right here uses ask line, which was my very first uh, concept for a brief second of how I was going to uh, get input from the user. As you saw before, we already have, well, I've started implementing that in the edit function. So the ask line is, uh, as we should say, deprecated, uh, even though it only existed for like probably a couple of days. So um, that is no longer of any real significance. We come down, we do use the load queue file. Currently, that is just one that I've made, which is trip.scn. And we will do the scroll window, but notice scroll window of zero doesn't actually scroll the window. What it does is it just prints what's currently in the buffer on the screen. So that is the initial bam, right from the buffer onto the screen, no scrolling. If it scrolls, to scroll it, we have to do a negative one or a positive one. So a zero just prints it out. Now we have our main loop, which the escape key will uh, break us out of currently. And we have the switch key, and this is pretty simple. Um, when we're not editing, we can go up and down and scroll and look. That's all we need to do. And then we can hit E if we want to edit, and that's it. And the escape to quit. So that is the summary or basics of how the program my trucking application to keep my finances is how it is at this point of course changes will come and i'll do more on on the program um so with that i'm gonna say farewell thank you for watching and i will catch you in the next video I don't know what I was thinking, but before I let you go, I'm going to run the program. You guys didn't even see it run. Man, what am I, what am I doing here? Oh, there's errors. What? No, there's no errors. Oh, warnings, because I didn't have warnings. Okay. I have to see what those are about. Now, let's see. So here it is. The, this is in our main loop. And we are scrolling. Normally, it scrolls faster than this, so... It's being extra sluggish, possibly because I'm recording right now. Probably. Like I said, this laptop, it is an El Cheapo, which is usually what I buy because in a couple few years, you know, I'm throwing them away anyway. So, and if I hit E for edit, now I'm on the very first question. And if I scroll down, notice that in the next line, it will skip and go right to the next question. So... But it shouldn't have gone. Oh, no, it should have gone there. Um, because origin, I have it on a blank line, so you get full line space to enter in information. So same with destination, pay number, uh, load number. So, yeah, it's all working good here. And the load number, I can show you. It's like 65535. It could be any number, but, you know, programmer wants to pick that one, right? Um so now I can't hit any other numbers, right? But I can hit an S. So there's the S. If I hit a backspace, I delete stuff. So that's cool. So 654321 doesn't go any further. So if I hit S now um, and I go left one and I hit delete, it deletes it last night. You couldn't delete it, and that's why I was talking about the extended asking. And I sorted that problem out. And if I go left again and I hit delete, it does as you would expect, deletes. So 
those um, that's just part of the implementation of taking input or the custom input routine uh, for this. So that's where I've gotten so far. Like I said, I've gotten almost uh, actually pretty much getting farther than I was in the conversation before because I was running into so many little side problems and issues and trying to make things work faster and optimize, you know, optimizations. And uh, I'm not really trying to optimize anything. I'm just trying to create a program that I can use. So, all right, now that you've seen the exciting program, uh, now I conclude this video. Thanks again. Catch you later. Bye.